Um, today we look into the last chapter of um, particle filter based simultaneous localization and mapping. That means we present a variant of FastSlam that, is, that allows us to build grid maps. So, so far, all the mapping that we have done um, was using um, landmark based approaches to SLAM. That means we assume to have landmarks in the environment that we can identify with our sensor and that we can use as, or based on, typically based on features, um, we extract, identify those landmarks and build a map of those landmarks. That means we store the X, typically XY um, or XYZ location of those landmarks in the environment and we so far discussed two main approaches or paradigms to do that. One was the Kalman filter based approach and the second one was the particle filter based approach using FastSlam. And what I would like to present today is to um, look into a variant of FastSlam that is designed to operate on grid maps. So I've introduced grid maps, to, I think it's two weeks ago, um, in combination with a short intro to scan matching, a very short introduction to scan matching. And these are two concepts we are going to exploit today in order to build a particle filter um, based system for simultaneous localization and mapping for building grid maps. The advantage of those grid maps in brief was that we do not require um, predefined feature um, extractors or that we need to have knowledge what kind of features we are going to observe in the environment or landmarks we have in the environment and that we can just take um, observations of obstacles, for example, from laser rangefinder in order to build a map of the environment and the map of the environment was a grid similar to an, to an image um, where for every cell or in the uh, image notation that would be a pixel, we store the probability that this cell or this place in the environment is occupied or free. That was kind of the key idea of occupancy grid maps. So in the end we get a map which is very similar to an image and every pixel is in the perfect case either black or white. White means free space, black means obstacle and um, as we are never certain about what we measured and what the world looks like, we maintain a probability, a so-called occupancy probability for each cell. And um, if this probably uh, tends towards one, with a high likelihood this place is occupied. If this probability tends towards zero, that means that this cell is very likely to be not occupied, and that means free. And then we um, used, introduced particle, uh, particle filters, first for localization as one way for tracking the pose of the robot using um, a cloud of particles where every particle is a pose hypothesis and we we've given a map of the environment we could very effectively localize a robot. We did that very very brief discussing the individual steps of the particle filter algorithm and then last week we looked into FastSlam um, for, landmark for landmarks um, that was a, the first particle filter based approach to SLAM in the robotics community that worked efficiently on large scale or larger scale maps, so up to, let's say, a million of landmarks. Uh, we can actually use FastSlam. And the key idea was here to separate the estimation of the um, belief about the trajectory of the robot and the map of the environment into two parts. One part was estimating only the trajectory of the robot using a particle filter, and then for every particle, doing a mapping with known poses for each individual sample. So every sample or every particle carried its own map. And this way we get a belief or joint belief about the trajectory that the robot took and the map of the environment. Because we first estimate the trajectory of the robot and then say given this trajectory the world will look like this or that is the map. And this way we get a joint belief. We did that for, um, for, for landmark based SLAM exploiting two facts. Facts one, that we can track a low dimensional space efficiently with a particle filter. We used it for the pose. And once we know the poses, mapping is easy. These were kind of the two insights that we exploited in this approach. And today, I would like to look how can we actually do that for building grid maps. So not building um, a map of features, of landmarks, but to build um, a dense grid map, separating the space into occupied and not occupied cells. We also, this video you actually have seen before, what happens if you just take our dometry information and perform mapping with known poses. That was the algorithm um, of Moravec and Elphys that I introduced in chapter 10, I think, of that course. And you can see here, um, if we just use raw odometry information in order to um, 
as, as kind of the ground truth poses, and just before mapping with known poses, we get a map of the environment that is not at all suitable for navigation tasks. So you can see, we can guess that here are some corridor environment, parts of the environment which look like a corridor. This may be rooms, but there's everything else in that is wild guessing. And so this does not work. So the assumption, or what, the, the assumption that we made in this approach that we know the poses of the robot based on odometry um, actually kills this approach. So this assumption does not hold. So we actually explicitly have to model the poses of the robot in our belief. And that's something we already knew um, as we used this for uh, in the Kalman filter-based approach and uh, in the landmark-based approach, but this was an Nice illustration because on the grid maps you directly see is with, the, with your own eye as a human that this map is inconsistent or it's very unlikely to represent what the environment in reality looks like. Um, so in the key idea today is the question is can we actually exploit the ideas that we used in FastLAM in order to build a grid based variant of FastLAM. That means using this factorization, this raw blackballization of our belief um, and split it up into two parts and then use a particle filter to estimate the pose, and then use a per-particle dependent map um, to estimate the map of the environment. So that worked uh, in that way, so we had our uh, belief about the poses of the robot and the map of the environment, um, given our observations and our controls, and we split that up with this idea of raw black polarization that we have one posterior about the path that the robot took. It's similar to localization except that we don't have a map given here and this um, is what we will use the particle filter for exactly in the same way as we did that for um, fast lamp for landmarks and then we have the second belief over here which is the map posterior given the poses of the robot and the question is how can we actually estimate that um, and obviously we expect this to work differently um, in the grid based uh, setting because the map representation is different. Yes, please. And the path posterior you used x from 0 to t, and yes. the map posterior from 1 to t, what's the difference? So the xt, so what you have is if you have um, n odometry commands, you will have n plus 1 poses. Because, yeah. uh, yeah. so you have one more. And what x0 is to be used for is to set the initial uncertainty. So if your initial uncertainty is basically zero, they all start at one, all particles will start at one location. Otherwise, you can distribute them according to an initial belief, or you can actually use this to represent the center of your coordinate frame. And then what you typically do is you assume you don't have an observation at your at, um, x0, you execute a motion command, and um, which leads you to x1, and at x1 you get the first observation, that one. That's kind of the notation. And therefore you have you have T observations, you have T, um, uh, you have uh, T controls, and of course X0 here is ignored because we don't have any observation at X0, and therefore um, if we don't have an observation, we actually don't need the post, unless we want to set the center of the reference frame. So I, if I need it, I could edit here, but um, um, typically we don't need that. Any further question at that point? Okay, perfect. So, um, very similar to the um, landmark-based approach. So, once we know the poses of the robot, actually the mapping problem is easy, right? And um, this is exactly the same fact we want to exploit for um, the grid-based approach. And if you look to the graphical model that we obtain in this setting, it's exactly the same one we had before, except we now have kind of this single map estimate and not the individual landmarks split it up separately, but except of that, the graphical model is exactly the same. And here you can also see that you start at x0, and then you go to x1, and the control command, oh, that is wrong, so this way x1 to xt, this is an old notation which has changed um, during the, uh, how we used it before and how the probabilistic robotics book uses it, so this is just an old, an old figure, so this would be x1 to x, uh, u1 to ut, um, sorry for that. Okay, and so the key ideas of the grid-based approach to, um, to SLAM using raw black plus particle filter is actually exactly the same as for the, um, for the landmark-based approach. So every particle represents one possible trajectory that the robot took. Every particle maintains its own map, and every particle updates its map 
using mapping with known poses, so the algorithm of Moravec and Alphas that we discussed. How does it look like? Here's an example. So consider we have three particles, which is obviously a number which is too small for, for a realistic problem, but just as an illustration. So we have three particles which travel around through the environment, and um, every particle, as I said before, has its own map. So this is a map of particle one, particle two, and particle number three. And as they have a different pose estimates or different trajectory estimates, they obviously will end up with different map estimates. And you can, especially we are here at a point where the robot closed the loop, so it's, the robot started over here, traveled around the trajectory, kind of closed the loop over here. And if you compare the map of particle one and particle number three, you can see that, um, or at least if you're kind of a little bit trained to, uh, what, to observe those um, occupancy grid maps, that you here have rep a repetitive pattern. This guy and this guy is actually the same um, obstacle in the environment, and you see this kind of ghost corridors over here. And this results from the fact that the robot simply took um, a wrong pose estimate, or had a wrong pose estimate, when re-entering the loop. So this is a map which is actually inconsistent. So there are obstacles in the environment, in the map, which do not uh, occur in the environment. In contrast to that, particle number one actually did a pretty good job, or decent job, um, to estimate the trajectory of the robot. At least the map looks visually consistent. So based on, if we look to this part of the environment, that seems to be a, a decent or a good match. And down here, particle number two, you can see a slight misalignment here. Um, um, so it's a small shift, but it's not as bad as particle number three. So if you look into uh, to the important weights that we obtain in the particle filter application, you would expect that particle number one has the highest weight, particle number three has the lowest weight, and particle two sits somewhere in between. Because the observations that the robot obtains do not fit that well with the model built so far for particle number three, but it fits quite well for particle number one. So we expect to have a smaller importance weight as the particle number increases in this example. Okay, so that was kind of exactly the same ideas we used in FastLAM fast or FastLAM 1 for the landmark case, just applied to grid maps, right? So that's easy. So let's see what the result of this approach will be. Unfortunately, that is a typical outcome if we do this. So this was a map built with, I think, around 2,000 particles um, using exactly the except, exact fast and one ideas, which we discussed last week, just used it for the grid-based case. So this does not fly. It doesn't seem to work. So why is this not going to work? One of the reasons is um, that we still need to maintain um, a quite large number of particles if my motion noise is high. So if I have a high motion noise, I need a large number of samples to cover the possible state in which the robot can be in with a sufficiently high number of samples. So I need to kind of cover the areas of high likelihood quite dense with samples. Um, that is important and this, um, in order to have that. And this is one of the problems that we have here, that we don't have enough samples to cover this, uh, the poses, um, the pose uncertainty well. The second reason is that this kind of representation, the map representation, is a little bit more brittle if you have a high pose uncertainty compared to, let's say, landmarks where I use uh, a, a Gaussian estimate for my landmarks. Because if I have a data association and I kind of have a sparse number of landmarks, I can say, okay, this observation corresponds to this landmark. This observation corresponds to this landmarks. And then by doing the update, the position of the landmarks will adapt, they will adjust. This is different for the grid map, where I just update every grid cell independently of the other grid cells. So if I'm misaligned, the map is much easier screwed up compared to the, um, to the landmark-based case. So a grid map built with known poses, where the known poses are wrong, is typically less usable for navigation compared to a landmark-based map. Obviously, the, landmark, the location of the landmarks may be also slightly inconsistent, or may be inconsistent if you observe them uh, from a pose which is not the right pose. But at least the map is often still usable for navigation. You may not be always at the same, at the correct position in a global reference frame, but you're still often able to align the robot with respect to the local estimates of those landmarks. Okay, so this doesn't seem to work. So we have a um, high motion uncertainty, high motion noise, and not enough samples to cover that. 
So one of the ideas is to actually let us improve the pose estimate before we apply this approach and see if this actually works better. And um, what is one way to improve your pose estimate? An easy way that we discussed already in the lecture. Yes, that is true. Um, let's go for the easiest way to do to to incorporate an observation. Scan exactly, scan matching. So the, the the easy thing we can do is okay before we run this algorithm. So we don't change the algorithm. We just run an incremental scan matcher before. That means we align the scan at time t with respect to the scan at time t minus one. We just kind of locally adjust the poses so that the scans overlap best. We can do this from time step t minus one to t, or we can take, let's say, last 20 scans and it'll then align a new one against the last 20 and ignore then the t minus 20, scan with ID t minus 20, and then kind of maintain always the last 20 scans and get a good alignment. That actually works quite well. And this was exactly the idea of scan matching that we um, said so far. So the is exact, so it's exactly the same slide we discussed two weeks ago. So what we're trying to do at every point in time, at time t, we try to maximize the uh, probability that consists of the observation model, so the um, current observation at time t, the current estimate at time t, and this is m t minus 1 should here reflect the um, map built up to time t. And then um, this is the odometry model. So given the best pose we had at the previous point in time, what are the best pose at the current point in time? And then we try to find the xt that maximizes this probability. It's just kind of, you can see this really as an alignment of the, of the new scan with respect to the map, map built so far. And typically, this map built so far takes into account, let's say, the last 20 scans or last 10 scans. That's how the standard way, how scan matching um, is done. And if we do that, um, we just had the example, so this is what the uncertainty um, of a particle filter looks like by a robot traveling, in this case, around five meters, four and a half meters straight, and then doing a left turn, so this is a particle distribution that I obtain using raw odometry. If I use scan matching, I typically get more accurate, you can see this here by the blue particle clouds, because the um, the, the uncertainty is much smaller because we take into account the observation as well as the odometry information to um, incrementally uh, optimize the pose that the robot takes. So as a result of that, if we take the blue distribution instead of the red distribution, we could argue that we actually do better. And so this is an example is just applying scan matching the map that this approach builds. And this is the same data set we have seen before. So we can see here, um, as soon as the robot retraverses parts of the environment, there are misalignments. So this is kind of three times visiting the same place, but always having a slightly wrong pose estimate, because the robot only aligns its current scan against the last 20 scans. So this is just an incremental approach. But as we can see here, there is an uncertainty. There's, there's obviously an error in the map, but the error is much, much smaller to what we had before. So if we take this as an input to our algorithm, we are expected um, to actually perform a much better job than we did uh, that beforehand. And this was actually an approach which was um, proposed by Dr. Cannell in 2003 um, that uses scan matching and as kind of a pre-correction step and then run FastLAM1 for grid maps. You have one small problem in this approach if you look to that from the mathematical point of view. That means um, if we take the particle filter algorithm for FASTLAM1 as we discussed it, it said that as a proposal distribution, we use the odometry motion model. And then to update our weight, we used our observation model. So now we're using the observation already in the proposal because we have a scan matched input. And that in turn, must change our weight computation. So we do something, although the result looks decent, we will do something mathematically wrong if we apply this approach directly. So De Cannell found a nice workaround for that problem. And his key idea was, okay, 
let's not scan match the whole input. Let's scan match only chunks of the input. So we say we take our, um, our log file, our, our data stream. Let's say let's scan match always blocks of let's say 100 poses. So I scan match 100 poses. I scan match the next 100 poses, the next 100 poses. So I, I, you can see that it's locally consistent or decently built maps. And then he used the particle filter to only estimate the jump from chunk one to chunk two, from chunk two to chunk, chunk three, using the standard fast limb approach. You can see this as kind of building small maps and aligning those small maps. So if you see this, into, look into the graphical model, how this looks like, we take um, k, so it's a junk, chunk of size k, or k minus one here, um, observations and odometry commands, and use this, perform scan matching, to estimate how we go from x0, x0 to xk. So we do scan matching. And then we just do one step with our, um, with our current odometry information. And so this is kind of this odometry u prime. So we take our scan match odometry and then one real odometry, real odometry and add that on top of that. This guides us to uh, xk. And then we just take the case observation, so the one that we obtained in this last pose, and apply the particle filter algorithm. So we kind of, you can see this as not taking a single observation, but combining many observations into one local map, and then applying the particle filter only to go from one local map to the next local map. In this case, you still do mathematically the right thing, because you just um, estimate uh, with a particle filter the poses of um, xk with respect to x0 and x2k with respect to xk. You just have kind of, um, you have much less steps that the particle filter actually has to perform. Um, and there's something which is called mapping or raw black uh particle filtering um, with an improved odometry. And if you do that, you actually get pretty good results. So a small example over here. So this just now shows only the trajectory estimates, so not drawing the map. The robot started here, drove around, is now here shortly before the loop closure. What happens is now a loop closure occurs, so all the particles re-enter the known part of the environment. And as a result, those particles which are where the current trajectory estimate is in line with the previous trajectory estimate, they will get a high weight and the others will get a low weight, and so the one with the low weight will die out. So this actually happens here. So you can see here two hypotheses survived, and then the robot actually continues navigating through the environment, and this here, this animation only shows the, um, the trajectory estimate. So you can see how the robot, um, when the robot dry, moves through the environment, it, through unknown parts, it gets more uncertain. Whenever it reobserves something it has seen so far, it gets more certain. And this is then the resulting map that we observed, and this was kind of the loop closing point that we have. So this is again the same animation, but just showing in the background the map of the most likely sample. So therefore the map in the back always switches, or often switches, because that is the map which corresponds to the most likely sample. And using this approach, we can actually build um, decent maps for medium-sized environments um, with a number of samples that we can actually maintain in our memory and actually use this approach. So this is kind of the, the first solution of particle filter-based SLAM for building grid maps by, by Dirk Handel in 2003. So it took the ideas of FastLAM1, combined them with kind of building local maps by scan matching, fused both together, and then um, came up with a working system. Um, you still may see that as kind of an ad hoc, a little bit ad hoc solution, um, because we kind of artificially have to build these chunks, scan match those chunks, and then only use a particle filter for um, getting those chunks. It's kind of a little bit you know, to make it mathematically correct, it was kind of a little bit of a workaround for that. And the question is, can't we do that better? Can't we do a more fundamental, not fundamental approach, but starting from the particle filter itself and improving the way the particle filter works um, in a mathematically sound way in order to come up with a better approach? And this is the idea which Mike Mello or originally introduced in FastM2 for landmarks. And this is here is a variant how we can use this for grid maps. So what we do now, we move from FastM1 too fast them too, but do it here in the grid map um, based case. And the key idea, as we kind of very, very briefly discussed last time, is to use a better proposal distribution. So use the current observation in 
the proposal distribution of the particle filter to do kind of this scan matching, not as a pre-processing step, but inside the particle filter when drawing the next generation of samples, and then correctly taking into account the observation uh, or the fact that we use the observation in the proposal distribution when computing the particle weight. It's kind of the key ideas that we look into here. So we had this kind of <coughs> improved proposal that we I very, very, very briefly sketched last time. So what we do in here is, in order to estimate the pose of the case sample at time t, we draw that from a distribution which takes the full trajectory of, the, of this particle k before the odometry and the observations and tries to estimate um, xk. So the important thing is that we have the most recent observation zk in here, uh, zt in here, sorry. And this is the main difference to the previous proposal distribution that we had, that we explicitly take into account the observation. And this is especially helpful if you have a sensor which provides you, or which you can use to compute a pretty good local estimate, like a laser rangefinder, which gives you proximity information to, to obstacles just by aligning them by doing scan matching, as we have seen before. We get quite decent um, incremental trajectory estimates. And if we have a sensor with these properties, then we can actually um, use this in order to come up with a more accurate sampling strategy. That means the uncertainty of my proposal distribution is smaller and concentrates on the meaningful areas of the state space. And as a result of that, we need less samples and they're typically more efficient if we use this approach while being still highly accurate because we sample only in the high likelihood areas of our state space. Okay, let's have a look to that. So this is, this is what's kind of the optimal proposal. The only difference that I did already here, I kind of integrated the, um, the previous, previous poses, previous uh, observations and odometry commands into a kind of map built up to the current point in time. So this is kind of the map estimate of the particle number i up to time t minus one, so the index t minus one is kind of not shown in here, but it's kind of the map built so far by that sample. And so what we are now trying to do, we know the pose of the particle at t minus one, we know the map built so far, we know the current control and the current observation, say where should we end up with. So what we can do is we can apply um, basically Bayes' rule and end up with this expression over here. And these are well-known terms on top of here. So this is the observation model that we already know that we, for example, used in localization, and this is our odometry model. Right? We have the product of those two distributions, and this is where we want to end up with. And one of the key insights now in order to build an efficient algorithm is let's say, let's inspect those distributions. How do they look like? And if we look to these distributions, now assuming the, the case that we have a laser rangefinder, we can actually see that for the laser rangefinders, we get, actually get pretty good local estimates. So we get, can quite well align two scans, which are recorded at nearby poses, align them and come up with a, with a substantially improved pose estimate. And so this is a very peak distribution typically. On the other hand, odometry is a rather flat distribution because just by counting the revolution of the wheels, taking into account slippage, taking into account inaccuracies in our system, different properties of the ground surface, we actually get a rather flat distribution. So we can actually argue that this term over here actually dominates this product, at least in the area where the robot actually can be from uh, given the odometry information. And this is one insight we want to exploit now. Okay, so what we do is we, again, this is our proposal distribution. Let's call this term over here um, tau, just then the, the mask, not the, the math, but the notation gets a little bit easier. So whenever we have tau of xt in here, it means exactly this expression over here which is the product of the um, observation likelihood and the odometry model. Okay, so let's look into this term down here. This term down here is the, this is the current observation. This is the previous pose that's important, the map and odometry information. So what misses over here is xt if we compare it to this expression over here. So we are missing the current pose estimate. So what we can do is, we can actually, okay, that's no problem for us. We just integrate over all possible poses and multiply this expression with the, um, the likelihood that this pose actually occurs. 
So then we obtain this expression over here, and this expression is now, so the old expression over here, just dropping odometry because I don't need it if I have xt in here, times the likelihood that xt actually occurs, and here the odometry in the previous pose are in again. So what we have now here is this, ex ex this is exactly our term tau, right? So the, the expression that we have here is exactly the same in tau, except that we have this integral need to integrate over all um, poses xt. So we can rewrite this proposal distribution actually in this, in this compact form over here. And this is something we will be exp which we will actually exploit very soon. So we have, let's just repeating what was written before, just expand it. So this is our tau, this is our integral over tau integrating um, over the possible um, poses that the system can be. And now let's say, okay, let's, let's investigate a little bit closer this expression down here. We already said before that the, um, the observation model typically locally limits or gives us a locally peaked estimate. That means if we roughly know where we are by aligning two scans, we typically get a pretty accurate, uh, pretty peaked distribution. On the other hand, odometry, we said, okay, it's rather flat distribution but it limits us globally in the environment. That means if I know, I'm, let's say if the robot reports I was, I'm moving five meters forward, it's quite unlikely that I'm teleported away, a kilometer away. It's something which we typically can exclude. However, so this is kind of a global limit. So we have a maximum distance that the robot can travel if it reports a distance. Um, although we use a Gaussian distribution, this Gaussian can be, has, has infinitively long tails. In reality, the robot is not teleported away somewhere else. On the other hand, um, we may have two rooms which look exactly the same. So if I would only optimize for this expression over here, it could be that the robot is currently in this room over here, and the room next door looks exactly the same because it's exactly the same lecture hall. The robot would immediately get a bimodal distribution saying, I'm either here or there, both fits perfectly. That's definitely true, and therefore we have to exploit the product of both terms and understand the properties of those two terms in order to come up with an efficient algorithm. And the thing is, so this is kind of a flat distribution mode which has a single mode. And typically, it doesn't go to the very far tails of our distribution. This term over here can have multiple modes, but every mode is typically very, very peaked. So if you just sketch that, so the observation model is kind of the blue guy over here may look like this. So we have multiple of those peaks, but we have a, in, in the, the, the green plot over here gives us a, a local limit, a global limit, sorry. So it says, okay, we are here in this environment. We can't be here because this is something that odometry forbids. So the product of both terms is actually, we only need to actually consider, let's say this red, redly sketched part. So we can say, okay, given that this term is basically zero, it's close to zero, but let's say assume it is really zero in all poses which are far away from this estimate. Let's say which, whatever is six sigma away from the mean of the odometry that we have. So we can say, okay, we don't need to integrate over all possible poses about all positions in the environment. We just need to integrate around the local area of the mean of the odometry estimate. Let's say six plus minus six sigma or something like this. So we can be pretty sure that we are within that area. And then, but within that area, the product is, the product is typically dominated by the observation model. And still, both models contribute, but um, the, uh, the observation model kind of dominates the product over here. So the first thing we do is, we, we say, okay, we can approximate this term, but it's really more or less exactly the same if we don't integrate over all possible poses, but only those poses where, let's say, this expression is bigger than epsilon. And this is kind of the local neighborhood around, uh, which comes from the odometry estimate. So that's now what we have. Oh, sorry, this term over here. This is just a repetition of the definition of tau to have both everything on the same slide. So what we now need to do, we need to kind of find where are we approximately and then integrate around this local area over here. And so the question is, how do we actually um, sample from this term? Um, the problem is we don't have it in closed form. 
especially the observation model, which we can only evaluate point-wise, because we could say for every point, how well do the scans align? We can evaluate it point-wise efficiently, but we don't have a closed form for that. How can we actually efficiently sample from, sample from that term? And um, what could be good ideas to sample from that term? <coughs> we have something which we don't have in closed form, but we want to build a proposal distribution and sample from it. So we have a term we, or a function we can evaluate it point-wise. And we say, OK, we know in which area we are likely to end up because we know everything outside this local area is zero. And we can point-wise evaluate it. One way to do is we can just draw a couple of random numbers in that local area, evaluate it point-wise, and then uh, compute a Gaussian approximation of that. Right? Because we can draw efficiently from a Gaussian distribution. So that's something what I'm doing. I'm taking this term over here and want to compute a Gaussian approximation out of that. And then use this Gaussian approximation of the uh, proposal distribution. Okay, how does it work? We have this term, we say, okay, let's approximate this term by a Gaussian distribution. Let's assume this is how our distribution looks like in reality. So it's not really a Gaussian, right? It can be maybe not too far away from a Gaussian, but it's definitely not a Gaussian distribution. So the first thing we can do, okay, we need to find this area because we don't know where the robot is in space, so we need to find that area. The first thing we do is we have a pretty good estimate from our odometry. So let's perform scan matching. So we just do kind of a gradient, des a gradient um, descent in the, in the error function or you find the maximum of the, um, of this, um, of this probability distribution. Okay, the scan matcher told us, okay, we are somewhere here. That's kind of the mode. What we then do is we do exactly what I said before. We just draw some random numbers in the local neighborhood of this term, of this, uh, of this point, and then evaluate those points point-wise under this function, because I can point-wise evaluate this function. So, okay, I draw these samples, or maybe I just take a local grid. It's also fine. Let's take a, take a local grid around the, the position found here. And the size of this bubble over here, a plot, just gives me how high the value was that I obtained by evaluating this function. So these are points which are sampled around the maximum reported by the scan matcher. What I then can do is I can take those weighted samples and just compute a Gaussian approximation based on those weighted samples. Again, this, this, those two functions are not exactly the same, but they're not too far away from each other. And what I then can do, I take this Gaussian distribution, I draw samples efficiently from this Gaussian distribution and use this as my proposal distribution for um, my particle filter implementation. So what I did in the end here, I was kind of using, so before we had just the odometry motion model. The key trick is, okay, I also want to integrate, take into account the observation, the most recent observation. So I took this most recent observation and integrated into the proposal distribution. I did some transformation of that, came up with this term tau, or this is tau divided by the integral of tau over integrating over all poses. Then I said, okay, given my specific sensor properties, I said, there's only local area which really matters where this distribution is above zero. So I only need to integrate over those area, over this area. And this was exactly this term over here. And I said, okay, I, want, I need to have a form which is suitable for sampling, so let's approximate that by a Gaussian distribution and then um, use this as my proposal. So I have a proposal distribution from which I can sample efficiently because it's a Gaussian and which takes into account the observation and the odometry information. Kind of the first next step I can do to kind of you know, integrate the whole idea of kind of scan matching or scan alignment directly into the particle filter without having to have this work around. Once I did that, I computed these, um, these dots and kind of, so this was our function tau over, over here. I can actually say, okay, we can actually also uh, use these sample points very efficiently to approximate the integral over here. And um, Oh no, sorry, this was, I was too fast for the first step, sorry. So what I want to do is now I want to compute the, the mean and the, the covariance matrix of this Gaussian distribution. Um, 
So how do I do that? I said I, we take those sampled points and compute Gaussian approximation based on this sampled point. This is exactly what you see over here. So the xj are those, those points drawn around the maximum reported by the scan measure and then we evaluate it under tau and this gives us my mean and my covariance matrix um, that, um, that, that, that are the, the parameters of my, of, my, uh, of my Gaussian approximation of my function tau. So I approximated this function tau by a Gaussian distribution and these are the parameters of this Gaussian distribution. Is it clear to everyone how these, how these equations, where these equations come from? Okay, so just to repeat that, there's no black magic around that. So we wanted to compute a Gaussian distribution of tau. Well, we said, okay, we, we don't have a closed form of tau, but we can point-wise evaluate tau. And due to scan matching, we know where the mode is of this distribution. So we just sample points around the mode, or just evaluate it on a grid pattern. For every of those grid patterns, we, we compute the, um, the value of this xt under tau t, so this is tau t, and then use this to compute the mean and the covariance matrix. And this gives us a Gaussian approximation of tau. Okay. So, how do we need to compute, and of course, what I also can do is, if I have those points, I can also approximate the integral quite well, I just need to sum over those points. So this comes for free. If I, let's say, take a grid pattern over here, I just can sum over those values if I have a, um, a uniform, sem uniform spacing of the, uh, of the grid, I just need to sum over those points and have an approximation for the integral. So that's also easy. <coughs> okay. So now we have a proposal distribution which takes into account all the important information. That's great, that's what we wanted to have, but there's something else we need to do. The next thing we need to do is we need to say, okay, how do we now need to compute the importance weight? Because the important weight was given by the, uh, proposal by the target divided by the proposal distribution. And what we use in here is exactly the same term we ended up last week with FASTLAM1. How do we actually compute the um, the weight is the target by proposal, and if we take into account the optimal proposal distribution, this is the resulting weight that we get. So we have the new weight, it's kind of the old weight, or if I carried out resampling, this is always set to 1 divided by 0, so it goes away. And then I have the observation likelihood. The only thing which I'm missing right now here is the current pose of the sample. So by taking into account the most recent observation, the computation of the weight changes so that compared to the expression we had before, I'm missing xt over here. This makes it harder to evaluate this term. However, that's not a big problem for us because we can now apply exactly the same trick we used um, in the, uh, for setting up, for coming up with our tau here. So we use exactly the same trick we used in here. Of course, this is exactly the same expression, right? See this term over here? This is exactly the, the particle weight. So we do exactly the same trick as over here and come up with the integral of a tau. So let's do the same thing over here. So okay, okay, we have expanded to this expression integrating over xt. So the odometry motion model is now in here and we get back our xt which we need in order to efficiently compute the um, observation likelihood. So this now is exactly our tau. Nice thing. So this is the integral of our tau. So that's exactly this term over here. We said, okay, that's great. We just computed that term already when computing the proposal distribution, right? We computed this integral already. So we can just take, can just sum over those points xj um, evaluated under tau, which we used to compute um, our proposal distribution. So computing this guy over here. So this expression by which we divide the, our Gaussian proposal distribution is already the weight of our, um, of, our, of our distribution over here. So these are the points sampled around the maximum um, of the scan metro, that's our xj, 
we evaluate this point and sum over the k, k points we have drawn. So this gives us an important weight for every particle <coughs> and um, which is which directly results, which is which doesn't require any overhead in the computation because we computed this term already before in the proposal distribution. Okay, so to, to summarize what we have what we have seen now. So we have come up with a new proposal distribution, okay, following um, ideas that existed before, but kind of specially adapted here for the for the uh, grid map case, where we say we take into account the most recent observation to come up with a better and informed proposal distribution. And given this proposal distribution, there is a way we need to compute the weights. And then we can actually run our standard particle filter approach, except that we draw from a different distribution, exactly from the proposal I've shown here, and the weights are computed in that different way. And this is how the improved proposal looks like, because the improved proposal now takes into account the maps built by the particle so far, right? because it takes into account the map build so far and the current observation, so it can align to the structure of the environment. So consider example number A over here. Here the robot moves through large free space, so it doesn't get any observation because the, the, um, the, um, let's say all, there's no reflection, no object that reflects um, the laser beam, so it simply gets zero valid me readings. In this case, the um, P of Z given xt is just a uniform distribution because it doesn't tell me anything where I am. As a result of that, I end up with the odometry model automatically because if I don't have any observation, the best thing I can do, or no observation that I can exploit, the best thing I can do is I take my odometry information and I come up with this kind of distribution, so the typical banana-shaped distribution. If I'm driving in a corridor where I can't see the end of the corridor, that means using my sense observation, I can the robot can align itself very well to the right and left-hand side because it knows of the distance to the wall, but it has no idea um, or has a high uncertainty along the main axis of the corridor. So the estimate along the main axis of the corridor is just what results from the odometry information. So it kind of just uses odometry in this dimension and you use the observation in this dimension. This also comes out automatically. It's not that kind of there's an if-then-else statement in there, but just by as the, the sensor information does not allow me to estimate where I am along the main axis of the corridor, in this dimension, the uh, uncertainty of the Gaussian distribution actually bounds this. And if the robot reaches the end of this corridor, so you can see the end of the corridor, actually all samples are very, very concentrated in one spot because the robot can exploit its full sensor information as well as the odometry to estimate where it actually is. So it's nice, it's a an, it's an proposal distribution which aligns itself given the structure of the environment and given the most recent observation. So if we have a high answer, so if we don't see anything, there's no better way we can do than sampling the um, sampling from odometry. If I'm here in this situation, I don't waste any sample sampling to the right and left hand side as your standard odometry motion model would do. I sample only along the dimension where it really matters. In this case, I only sample very, very concentrated, again, in the, in the area which really matters. So the, dis the proposal distribution adapts to kind of the needs that the system has here, which is a very, very nice and elegant approach, or not elegant approach, very nice property, so we can actually exploit that. So are there any questions at the moment that I can hopefully answer? Nice. So just to kind of summarize that so far, we started with having FastLAM1 not taking into account observations. That did not work. Then we have the next track, use scan matching as kind of a pre-correction step, correcting those chunks that gets much better, gets us to a working system. Um, but still I have kind of this not very, um, let's say, clean particle filter based formulation. So let's try to takes this idea and integrate everything into the particle filter, into the proposal distribution, and then in every step I have the good proposal distribution um, and come up with um, decent estimates of the robots posed at every point in time, which I can nicely cover with samples in most situations, and then come up with this approach over here. 
So that's kind of the first key improvement I need to do if I'm heading for um, <coughs> building grid maps using a particle filter-based approach to SLAM. There's another thing I can actually improve in order to get a nice working system. That's kind of, let's, let us inspect the resampling step again. So consider that um, we have four particles over here, and in every step, <coughs> particles typically die out through, through the resampling step. Um, let's say in every point in time, this is t time one, time two, time three, times four, we actually lose one sample, just in this example. So in the worst case, which can happen, that after four steps, of n particles, n steps, even if I lose only one sample at, a po at, at every point in time, typically we lose more, um, often we lose more, um, all the particles which survive at time step t equals four stem back from this single particle. So if the history is longer, all the diversity is lost over here because they all stem from this particle. And so as a result of that, the um, resampling um, step can eliminate samples and lead to the fact that a lot of particles in the current estimate just stem from a very small number of particles if I go back a few time steps. <coughs> and that is problematic because, especially here in, um, in the SLAM context, we cannot easily recover from that. Because even if one of those samples by chance goes back to, the, to, the, to a good pose, as could happen in localization easily, here, the, the path trajectory estimate would still be wrong, the map would still be wrong. So that's something which, which hurts us in this particle filter-based approach. So the, um, the idea of this improved resampling technique, this low-variance resampling, which I, which I briefly discussed in the particle filter-based lecture, um, that helps to reduce its effect, because at least if all the samples have the same weight, none of those samples will die um, and will be eliminated. But still, this effect still exists there, just it spans over slightly longer periods of time. So um, what one can do is, let's say, let's, let's perform only what's called a select, uh, selective resampling strategy. Let's look to the distribution of the particle weights, and only if the particle weights differ substantially, let's carry out a resampling step. That means just because a particle, just one observation, doesn't fit very well to a sample, is not immediately um, eliminated, or dies out, very likely dies out in resampling step, let's keep them for a little bit longer periods of time and then only conduct the resampling step if the um, particles differ substantially in weight. Because if they differ substantially in weight, I say, okay, one sample is substantially better than another sample. So it makes sense to carry out the resampling step. But if all perform roughly the same, don't perform resampling at every point in time because the likelihood of um, of eliminating particles which are not too bad is actually quite high. And this is something which is called particle depletion or particle starvation. The particles simply starve um, because they are resampled too often. That's one problem that we can encounter. So the question is when should we resample? And one approach to do that is just look to the kind of, as a measure which is related to, to how much do the samples actually vary, how much do they differ. And this is something which is called uh, the number of effective particles. And this is, so I just take into account the squared weight and I sum that up one divided by this value. So this is a value which um, ends up if, um, which, which gives me a value between um, zero and the number of samples, if the samples were been normalized before. And the higher the number is, the harder it is for me to tell which sample is better. So if all have the same weight, I get the maximum value. And if just a one particle which has a weight of one and all others are zero, I get actually a weight of one. So not, not between zero and n, but between one and n. So the smaller the number is, the more important it is to resample because most of the particles have a bad estimate. The higher the number is, the worse that is. And one way, this is kind of the most easiest way to do this, okay, let's simply set a fixed threshold whenever this number of effective particles drops below a certain value, 
I actually um, conduct the resampling step. If this is not the case, then I, um, I simply don't do anything. So if I have a high value, I don't do anything. Otherwise, I perform a resampling step. Let's say if it's n half. If we have values between 1 and n, if we're approximately in the middle. If we are higher than that, we say no need to resample at the moment. Otherwise, um, let us resample. So there's an example over here, um, which is an interesting environment with two nested loops. So the robot started down here, drove around here, over here, then spent some time in this inner nested loop, and then closed the big loop. And this is one of those situations where um, particle filter applications which don't maintain a substantial diversity in the history fail to close the second loop. Because by traveling through this loop multiple times, all the particles, a lot of particles die out and only typically one sample or two sample, two different trajectory estimates maintain. What we can see here is a number of um, effective particles. So we start here, this was kind of 30 particles, we start with 30. So the value decreases over here, this is where the robot goes down here. Then it goes down here, and then it closes one loop, this one, this is around this time step. So here, the value drops below 15, and then um, resampling step is, is carried out, so this value bumps up to uh, around 30 again. Then the robot traverses this inner loop, so the value decreases, and then stays more or less constant. Because by just driving around here, the robot knows the environment already, there's no particle which does a particular better job than the other particles. And then at some point in time, the robot leaves this inner loop and closes the outer loop, and this is the effect where this happens. Again, then I say, okay, a lot of those estimates I had here were actually suboptimal ones, but just a few, one or two, or th well, in this case, kind of six, seven, did a good job, and then it makes sense to resample again and um, eliminate those samples over here. So this was kind of why the robot is visiting new areas, the likely the, the, this value slightly drops. When you have this loop closure, we have this, we have typically these big bumps because when we close loop, the robot is typically able to say quite effectively, okay, this was a good sample, this was a bad sample. And if we revisit already known areas, typically not that much happens because there's, I don't have that many means to estimate which particle is, is better or which is worse. And this here exactly was the second loop closure done down here. Okay, so that was some kind of an easy add-on to the particle uh, to the, to the uh, um, particle filter implementation, this selective resampling, but this helps to maintain diversity of samples. So this now is a result of the, the Intel research lab. This was a data set which was completely screwed up in the beginning, just using a small number of samples this time, here 15 samples. And you can see here all these inaccuracies that we have seen from the scan matching or from the original approach now have been gone completely. So it's a rather um, clean map, so it's kind of one centimeter grid resolution and um, shows a rather accurate estimate of the environment for this, um, for this data set over here. So there's at least no visual inconsistency that we observe over here. Also have a small video um, how this approach runs. So the robot moves around. You can see that the particle diversity is maintained. When the robot closes the loop, it can perfectly say which samples did a good job and a bad job. So there's still a few hypotheses maintained. So whenever the robot walks into a new room, kind of you can see that the the uncertainty spreads out a little bit, and whenever it comes back, it partially maintains this because the threshold has not dropped below n half for carrying the resampling step. But at some point in time, you will conduct the resampling step, and then a lot of <coughs> hypotheses from the past trajectory actually die out. But you can also see here, compared to the first approach that we have seen, the particle cloud is much more concentrated. So we don't have this big diversity of trajectories that are generated. And the reason for that is that the particle filter only draws the samples in the areas which really matter. So we have a much more concentrated particle cloud around the areas of high likelihood. There's another example. So this is our campus. So we are sitting here currently in 101. That's building 79 where we are sitting, the parking space over here, building 106, 51, 52, the Mensa building. And this thing is all the vegetation um, and trees and um, everything which was, which is, sits here in front of our building 101. And one of those examples built in this case was kind of 
30 samples. Rather long trajectory, it was nearly two kilometers. Um, there's another famous data set, which is the killian Kurt data set, also called the Infinite Corridor data set. It's recorded at MIT <coughs> by the group of John Leonard, and this is an environment where you have a lot of long hallways. And um, even, so you can pass between buildings through those glass areas, which are pretty hard to match for a scan matching approach because everything is glass. And you can actually walk through several buildings without leaving the buildings, which is great if you do uh, this robotics approach. So um, just a few pictures. So this is the main building. You can see here that actually sits over here. Um, so this long corridor is actually this small corridor over here. So you have really long corridors in there. And so this is a small video which shows how this approach works, kind of overlaid with a satellite image. And um, what you can see in here is, so red is always the most likely trajectory. As the particle cloud spreads out, um, move through unknown environment, the particle cloud spreads out. Then revisiting, um, typically the, the sample set, uh, the particle filter can identify which particle did a good job, which did a bad job, and can eliminate those. Sometimes this decision is a little bit delayed. So you see the robot re-entering, moving around a little bit, and then the resampling is conducted. Now, this happens now, very soon. Um, and this is an effect of this selective resampling strategy, that it doesn't resample all the time. And um, so you can see now here how, in the end, we end up with a pretty decent estimate, at least kind of seems to be globally also consistent if we kind of at least roughly overlay this with a satellite image, although these are kind of not autophotos which are exactly um, aligned over here. And uh, we don't know exactly where the corridor is in here, but at least if we align some of the, of the, of the rooms that we see with uh, the outer walls, um, that doesn't seem to be a too bad estimate. And this is kind of one of the, let's say, most advanced particle filter-based um, systems that you find for building grid maps. And <coughs> they're actually more modern systems uh, or robots but you use a very similar technique. It's slightly different. They have different sensors set up, but it uses something very similar. So this is a Samsung Hudson robot, um, a new Hoover. Well, probably it's now not that new anymore. It's kind of one or two years old. Um, or was a prototype at that time. Um, you can see it's still some wireless antenna and stuff registered in here. And the important thing is that this guy actually builds a map of the environment using a raw black wise particle filter uh, in order to build a map in order to know where its base station is so you can actually drive back in its map. So this is what it does right now. So this is a place it found with a mapping approach and now it kind of perceives its station, does a, let's say, last small post correction to find its um, docking station in order to recharge so that you don't have to collect the robot which ran out of battery power every evening you come home. So this guy actually uses a map to first more systematically clean and second to actually find his, um, his home location in order to recharge himself. So that's a technique which actually also made it out of the research labs now in um, commercial, uh, in com to commercial products. However, I wanna, don't want to, um, let's say, I don't want to stop here. I also want to report about some of the disadvantages that this technique actually has um, and how to fix them. The first, so what do you think is the main limitation of the approach that we discussed so far in this kind of building the proposal distribution step? So what assumptions have we done when computing this proposal distribution? Static, yeah. So we still have a static environment assumption in here. That's absolutely right. That isn't clearly an assumption. And, um, but it was more, a little bit more technically down to during the derivation of this proposal distribution, we made some assumptions. And I also explicitly stated them. We, so what are, what are the key assumptions that we did in deriving this proposal distribution to efficiently draw samples from? Exactly. So this was one of the assumptions that we did. We say, okay, if we assume that we have an accurate sensor which gives us, which allows us to do scan alignment accurately. That's true. That's fine. That's kind of a physical setup that we assume the robot has. Um, I'm kind of often fine with such an assumption if my uh, robot has it. So, the, so this guy here, uh, there, this assumption is violated. So need, the, the engineers of Samsung may 
uh, quite likely have invested some time to actually coming up with a different sensing modality, uh, and but still they can do that. Um, but there was kind of another um, assumption that we explicitly made in here, which mathematically, which may hurt us. Did you use a measurement as a proposal? Uh, There's nothing bad about using measurement as a proposal distribution. That was absolutely sound to do that. Um, it has something to do with that, but that was not the, the reason. Uh, which assumption have we made in this context? Uh, we use the Gaussian to exactly. approximate uh, our uh, combined model of the, uh, of the observation. And the yeah. So this term tau, we approximate it by a Gaussian you know, to efficiently draw samples. So what happens if my distribution looks like this? So this is actually a real-world distribution obtained with the robot in an cluttered environment. And this is, if I kind of, on a, on a dense grid, point-wise evaluate tau at every point in time and compute the exact values. So this is here for, printed for a fixed orientation, but varying in x and y. So in reality, this is a 3D plot, but that you don't, then you don't see anything anymore. So we take this plot here and approximate this by a Gaussian distribution. That can work out, if this is in reality the, the really good match, we may get a Gaussian which is centered around here, so that should work. But what happens if this is the, the right peak? or this is the right peak, or we concentrate around this peak and in reality this peak. And we are screwed. And that's one of uh, the problems that we have. So especially in case of loop closure or cluttered environments, we may have situations where this assumption that we say, we have a locally bounded area from the odometry where we can be, and we have a very peak distribution from the um, observation model where we can be, and this is just one peak in this area. From, so kind of the observation model just generates one peak within the area that makes sense from odometry. If this is the case, we are fine. But if this is not the case, and this is clearly one of those cases where we have a multimodal distribution, then this approximation is a poor approximation. I mean, still, we are drawing samples from this Gaussian distribution. So maybe by chance we have a few samples which end up at the right spot. But maybe not. So we can be lucky, but we don't have to be lucky. And... Um, so the question is, how can we handle situations like this? And actually, how often, also the question, how often does this actually occur? And um, so what we can do, at least for, um, for evaluating that, let's take those data sets and simply take the area where the robot can be from the odometry point of view, and let's simply let point-wise evaluate all possible states. That takes ages, that takes hours, takes days to do that. I don't care, let's say, just compute once the right thing, Let's see how far our Gaussian approxima approximation is actually away from this optimal solution or from the, from the right way of doing that. So we can use something like statistical testing, which you um, should have heard in your statistics course, something like the Anderson-Darling test or some other tests to test if a distribution is at least approximately a Gaussian distribution. And if we can, the second thing we can do is we can take the exact distribution, we can take our Gaussian approximation and then using something like uh, uh, KLD or some other way for estimating how, how much do these distributions differ. So are there kind of, it has one of the distributions high values where the other distribution has low values at some point, for example. And we can actually do that with a couple of data sets that we have all seen here and evaluate that and say how often does my statistical test tell me yes, this is a Gaussian distribution. And how often does it tell me, no, it's not a Gaussian distribution? So this, in this number of cases, the system said it's a Gaussian distribution. So between 75 and 90%, roughly. In those cases, we in a Ga everything is Gaussian. It looks perfectly fine. The statistical test said, I'm fine. That's a Gaussian. That's good. If we're in a non-Gaussian world, which are these two things, we can say, OK, let's inspect the difference between our approximation and the exact solution in more detail. And it actually turns out that quite often we are non-Gaussian, but we have a single mode, like whatever. Um, we have more or less a uniform distribution in one dimension, but it's kind of bounded like a box distribution where the statistical test says, no, that doesn't work well. But those single modal distributions can often be still approximated kind of well by a Gaussian distribution. So that doesn't hurt us too much. The more tricky case is this case over here, where we have explicitly multimodal distributions. So where we really flaw on that. And um, again, this is a comparably high number. So in this case, between whatever, 3 and 7 or 3 and 6%. Um, that doesn't mean in, we often screw up. Actually, in most cases, we still sample particles in 
likely areas of the state space in the system as we have multiple of those samples, let's say 100 samples, there's still a chance that a couple of those samples do a good job and if we can, let's say after a few time steps, identify which sample was, did the right job and which one did the good job, we are still fine. But in some situations, we actually flaw. And this is one of those examples. So this, this plot I showed you actually comes from a, a real physical situation by analyzing why did this approach did not work. So what we see here is actually that's a map of the um, computer science AI lab at MIT. And so this was a corridor and it was, it was kind of rather cluttered lab space. And at this position over here, the particle filter simply committed to the wrong mode. So it computed the Gaussian approximation around the wrong mode, which seemed to match pretty well at the moment, but um, actually failed. And so um, we got an orientation error here in this pose, and then we kind of you see that this part of the environment should actually be this part of the environment. So it's kind of, these are obstacles or corridors which don't exist in reality, or those two corridors are actually the same. So in this case, the distribution was clearly multimodal, but we used a single mode to approximate it. And that caused the system to diverge. The question is, how can we fix this? We still have the assumption that we say, okay, we have this kind of bound from our odometry, so we, we, we can't be teleported somewhere else. So maybe it's not a good idea to start, let's say, take what, what, what you typically did is we take our, our odometry estimate and then perform scan matching, and then we end up in one of those modes, but it's quite a random in which mode we actually end up. Actually, I end up in typically in the mode which is closest to the mean of my odometry, which often it's a pretty good approximation for that, but in some situations, as this situation, this doesn't work out. So let me illustrate how that typically works. So let's say this is our distribution in reality, so we have a mode one and a mode two. Well, the standard approach does, okay, it takes odometry over here, and then performs scan matching. So if I perform scan matching from here, so evaluate how does the value look to the right and to the left, and then I kind of optimize this, so we'll end up actually in this mode over here. So what we do is we we approximate this mode by a Gaussian distribution, then we draw from that, so the standard approach would generate samples somewhere in this area. That's okay, but what if mode two would be the right thing? Then we are we actually flawed over here. And this depends on the, let's say this was the uncertainty with results from odometry, which does tell me I'm, I'm somewhere in here, and just by chance I ended up in this mode number one. So a better strategy than we could, let's say, let's say first draw samples just from odometry, so all those samples down here, so we cover the likely area, and then perform scan matching for every of those guys and see in which mode they end up with. So the red ones will actually end up in mode two, and the blue ones will end up in mode number one. So what we have in here now is a multimodal distribution. So we say, okay, we get different, substantially different results from our scan matcher. What I can either do is I just say, okay, just take the number of samples which ended up in, in, in this area, the number of samples which ended up in this area, and then just could draw one, the likelihood it's proportional to the number of samples in there, and then commit a one mode. So some samples will choose the blue one, some samples will choose the red one, and then we have hopefully both modes covered. And if we do that, actually, that works very effectively. So here, this multimodal distribution is still there, but it will simply put some samples in here, some samples in here, some samples in here, let the approach run and see which one survives. And this actually helps me to come up with an accurate estimate. We can also estimate <coughs> what is the errors of those, of those distributions. What you show here is for these three different data sets. If you take this, the Gaussian proposal that we had before, what you see here is a KLD value, so a value of zero means both distributions are the same. The higher the value is, the larger the difference between both distributions. And it turns out here that, so we have, in a lot of cases, there's basically no error, and um, in some cases we make a small error, small error, and this value here is actually should be 0.4 plus, so it means 0.4 and everything bigger. So we have a high approximation error, which we do from time to time in this case. These are this 5%. So this is this multimodal case where we approximate it by a um, unimodal distribution. If we take this two-step sampling process, so we first draw from odometry and then do the scan matching for every of those samples, we actually reduce this error here to a really small value. And actually this happens consistently, consistently through different data sets. So the big approximations errors we do are 
gone. They're not completely gone, so this value is still there. I don't you probably don't see it, but down here is a very, very small value. But so there are still situations where we don't cover that well because let's say we don't have enough samples or they all converge to the right mode and didn't cover the, the second mode, which was the right one. As it's a sampling procedure, there's a chance to make an error and some small remaining errors in there. But it's substantially smaller to these errors we actually have seen over here. So this two-step sampling procedure is actually a very, very efficient way of covering even multiple modes. So although we have this Gaussian uh, proposal, if we generate multiple hypotheses where this Gaussian is, and then we do a local Gaussian for everyone, we are typically um, pretty good off. So it's kind of a multimodal, uh, so a sum of Gaussians what we actually do, just separated or distributed over the individual particles. So this two-step sampling procedure allows us to uh, better cover the situations where we have the multimodal um, likelihood function, so where tau is a multimodal distribution, that um, we're just approximating this by a single Gaussian distribution is not a very good solution. So if you have unimodal cases, we obviously end up with exactly the same result. It's maybe a little bit more costly, but actually doesn't really matter. And this, it's not the bottleneck in here that we generate more samples, look to which mode which they converge, and then um, if, they, if they all converge to the same mode, we actually have a unimodal distribution. And so it's a minimal computational overhead. So um, just to summarize this Gaussian proposal, yes and no, because it's also something which um, can give you an idea why maybe techniques which rely on Gaussian distributions all the time are not the best idea. Actually, in most cases, the Gaussian is actually a pretty good representation of what happens. So we said before, in up to 90% of the cases, it actually works. It, it, it is a Gaussian, though. The statistical test says it is a Gaussian. Another around 5% of the cases, or up to 5%, it actually says, okay, it's not really a Gaussian, but it has a single mode. Maybe the, it's not perfectly a Gaussian shape, but it's, the Gaussian approximation will not be too bad. But there are a few cases, let's say around 3 to 6% in all the data sets analyzed in here, or that we actually tested. It turns out that there is a substantial difference. And you can be lucky that your Gaussian approximation by chance covers the right mode. And quite often, you're lucky. But there are situations where you're not lucky. And then you actually completely flaw if you don't have any way to cope with multimodal distributions in here. OK, so just to wrap that up, what we've seen here is, or presented today, is first FastLAM2. So the idea of taking into account um, the most recent observation into the proposal distribution to come up with an efficient algorithm for building maps with particle filters. We did that especially in the context for grid maps because we're interested in, in actually building grid maps. And the idea of using an improved proposal distribution is actually very similar to doing scan matching, but now on a per particle basis. So we don't do this scan matching um, beforehand and building these chunks of maps. It's very similar to doing a uh, scan matching on a per particle basis. Uh, and this is a result of the fact of, of mathematically, in a mathematically sound way, integrating the most recent observation into the particle filter and here, especially into the proposal distribution. And the second thing uh, was actually that this resampling, uh, re selective resampling strategy actually also helps to maintain a particle diversity. So I haven't shown that um, on a lot of plots in this case, but. Um, that's actually one easy way for allowing the particle filter to maintain multiple distinct hypotheses over more extended periods of time and allows me to efficiently come up with solutions over here. And we are now also at the point where um, I would like to close the particle filter based um, approaches and also one step where we kind of leave a little bit the world of the probabilistic robotics book um, because this part is not part of the Probability Robotics book anymore because the developments here are newer, so these results are from kind of 2005 to 2007. And um, the other thing is that um, also the things we do in the future, in the remainder of the course, looking into um, graph-based slam approaches and least square error minimization to solve those um, is something which I like to explain slightly different as it's done in the book. Therefore, the part so far is well covered by the book. The part 
which we do in the remaining part of the course is partially covered by the book, partially introduced in a slightly different way, but there's a lot of online resources that I put on the website, um, either original papers or tutorials, um, which also give you a chance to, um, let's say, reread some of the topics that will be presented um, during the let's say, last part of the course. So we're done with particle filters right now, and from next week on, oh, next week on, sorry, not next week, but from uh, January on, we will actually um, look into graph-based approaches to SLAM, so it's kind of the third paradigm that we investigate and which is today considered as kind of the most successful one or where most uh, approaches that are published, let's say after 2008, maybe, something like this, 2008, 2009, um, most of the new systems or modern systems use graph-based approaches because they have, some, they have some nice properties. They also make some assumptions again, uh, especially Gaussian assumptions, which you can also try to get rid of. But they have some really nice properties um, uh, that we are that are really useful for building those maps, and we will dive in very detailed into those approaches, presenting different techniques in there, so that also the last paradigm um, will be covered intensively actually until the end of the course. We will look into that. In the end, also looking a little bit into data association or how to build complete systems. Not only the engine in the back, which does all the estimation process, but also how to come up with um, aligning observations and techniques like that. If you just want to have a look to that, there's actually an open source implementation of this uh, approach, which I presented here available. It's called G-Mapping. Um, you find it in OpenSlam or other open source repositories. Just Google for it. Um, I have to say that the code is not maintained anymore since 2008, so I'm actually not sure if it still compiles or requires Qt3, actually. So, um, so you probably need to have a virtual box with an old Ubuntu to actually get that running in case you want to try that. But it's available uh, under this URL where you actually find the source code, uh, which is available for that system, in case you want to try that out or want to dive into that. That's it from my side for today. Are there any final questions which haven't been raised during the presentation? Okay, so then there's a new mapping sheet online. It's also brought it here, uh, which asks you to implement actually FastLAM, um, providing some of the functionality in Octave code, um, and use the time over Christmas. Uh, maybe you still, you still have the full week. Um, I strongly recommend you to actually work on that and um, Get a complete system running that you can run then this fast slam approach um, and it will be discussed on Wednesday, on Wednesday the 7th of January, so after um, the Christmas break, um, there's an exercise on the 7th and then from January on we will actually look into the graph based approaches. So from my side the particle filters are over and I'm looking forward to next step and see you all next year. Thank you very much.